Fish are the most diverse group of vertebrates on the planet. From the gigantic whale shark to the tiniest minnow. There are over 32,000 species of fishes that are known and new ones are being discovered all the time. That's more species than all of the amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals put together. Because of their diversity, fish have evolved varied reproductive strategies, ranging from the expected to the very bizarre. Whether it's they're born male and turn female, born female, turn male, or change back multiple times, fish have found a way to utilize sexual reproduction to their advantage in pretty much every way you can imagine. This sort of mixing and matching, sometimes I thought of it as sexuality a la carte. Take a little female characteristic here, a male characteristic there. I mean, this is very common in nature. Sex change as a normal mode, the reproductive strategy for animals, is something that I would say the general public doesn't know anything about. And they're absolutely fascinated when they hear about it for the first time. People are shocked almost sometimes, greatly surprised entertained by what these animals do. Most people have seen the movie Finding Nemo you know, with a little anemone fish and his mother disappears and his father raises him. What would happen in nature is that when Nemo's mother disappeared, Nemo's father would change sex and become a female. Nemo would mature into a mature male and they would form a mating pair. Wait, what? What really happens when it's time for love in the sea? Why do some fish species change sex? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct Emotion Club, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventures and scuba diving. And by the Do Unto Others Trust, A coral reef is a magical place with beautiful fish that come in all the colors of the rainbow. In Florida, the Bahamas, and the Caribbean, one very common species which is often overlooked among the larger and flashier residents on the reefs is a little fish called the bluehead wrasse. They come in almost um, three sexes, uh, you know, sort of three flavors. You have the females, the initial phase males that look like females, and then the large terminal phase males. Females and initial phase males are smaller and predominantly yellow in color, while the terminal phase, or TP male, is larger and bluish green with a barred pattern behind its head. Dr. John Godwin is professor of biological sciences at North Carolina State University. He makes a few trips to Key Largo, Florida each year to study bluehead wrasse on the nearby reefs. Day, these little fish take part in the same ritual. For most of the day, 
the animals are found feeding. Females feed on the upcurrent part of the reef, and then around midday, when their um, eggs have matured and they're ready to be spawned, then they'll migrate over the reef, and they usually follow the same path to the same spawning site every day. There, a feisty terminal phase male suitor is anxiously awaiting their arrival. So these TP males, they set up these territories on the down current side of the reef, and this is for about two to three hours in the middle of the day. Once the terminal phase male spots a receptive female, he begins his courtship. He starts darting about in a frantic circling pattern above the reef. When she's ready, the pair dashes towards the surface at lightning speed, releasing sperm and eggs into the water column where they will fertilize. Then they'll drift away from the reef and not get eaten and then they'll be in the plankton developing for we think a month to two months and at that point then they're capable of settling back as small juveniles on the reef. Very few fish survive their larval stages and grow into adults which is why females spawn many thousands of eggs during their lifetime. While the terminal phase male is aggressively defending his territory and trying to pair spawn with as many females as possible, the initial phase males have developed their own mating strategies. Some of these males, they go to the group spawn, where there'll be 20 to 50 or more other initial phase males, and the females will find their way to the group spawn. And there's no courtship there, but they'll spawn and release their eggs. And there's typically a number of males who'll release sperm at the same time. The other strategies that initial phase males will show include uh, sneaking and streaking. Some bold males try to blend in with the females inside the territory of a terminal phase male. Such sneakers have the audacity to try and join in while a terminal phase male pair spawns with a female. Streakers try to get in on the action by rushing in from a distance to join a mating pair. These types of behaviors keep the terminal phase male on high alert. So there's a lot of chases. Um, it also sometimes goes and kind of look under the yellow ones, and we call that inspection. We think it might be checking if it's a female or male. And then it's clear that he's not a female, and there's a huge chase that it <laughs> then takes place as the terminal phase male tries to drive him away. It takes time and persistence to become the top dog. They're all born as immature females. And then the initial phase males, what's different there is they can turn into males before they actually sexually mature, as opposed to when an adult um, reproductive female changes and becomes a terminal phase male. Once a terminal phase male disappears from a spawning site, sex change is triggered in the largest remaining fish. The largest female starts becoming aggressive and she'll start chasing the smaller ones and I guess they defer at that point and she goes on and changes sex. They change really, really quickly. So females oftentimes will see that they'll start to show male behaviors within minutes. Within a few hours, the female that is transitioning will act as a male during pair spawns, despite the fact that she isn't ready yet to release sperm. She turns into a fully functioning male within about a week that the permanent color, that deep blue that you see on their heads, that starts developing after about four to five days as their ovary is becoming a testis. And then to get that full terminal phase male coloration and the nice full green on their tail, that takes about three weeks. Both females and initial phase males can turn into a terminal phase male with the determining factor being size. But being top dog comes at a price. Females will oftentimes live two to three years, and they're actually very careful uh, because the main thing they need to do is stay alive in order to keep reproducing. Terminal phase males, they can't be cautious you know, when they're defending their territory and then they're courting, and they tend to live only about three months. It's very dangerous to be a terminal phase male, but it's also very lucrative in the sense of spreading your genes. They can go up to 30, 40, 50 spawns a day. 
and the record is one male in Panama for 180 spawns a day. So from an evolutionary standpoint, they're reproducing a lot more. They're leaving a lot more copies of themselves behind. So this is something called a size advantage model of sex change. If you can reproduce more effectively as one sex when you're small or young, and as the other sex when you're larger and older, then at some point you should change sex. What still remains a mystery to the experts is what happens in the body when fish change sex. In mammals, the gonads develop quite early, and they actually affect the brain's development. In fishes, it's actually the other way around. And the brain develops well before the gonads, and so you have this sophisticated environmental information gathering organ, and then the brain directs the development of the gonads, and so it's fundamentally reversed the way this process happens. What's kept me interested for 20 plus years in this little fish uh, include things like how does this change in a social situation turn into a change in the gonads? What is the wiring diagram, if you will? To find out, the experts are inducing sex change in females. We catch these females and then we measure them. 75.5 millimeters. We give them a tag so we can recognize individuals. Then we put them back. And then two days later, we remove the terminal phase males. And then we'll watch the female's behavior and we will recapture them after varying periods of time. So what we're trying to do is get tissue from the brain and from the gonads at different points after the start of sex change. And what we hope to do from that is then go and look at the expression of their genome and try and understand what are the genetic instructions, if you will, for changing your ovary into a testis. Another fish that switches from female to male during the course of its life is the gag grouper, a popular food fish that at times has been severely overfished. The majority of groupers are protogenous. And that word derives from proto and gynous, meaning first female. There are some groupers that are separate sexes, not a hermaphrodite, but most of the species that are economically important, red grouper, gag, um, scamp, change sex. Based at the Florida State University Coastal and Marine Laboratory, doctors Chris Koenig and Felicia Coleman have spent most of their careers studying grouper. In the early 1990s, they made a shocking discovery about gag grouper while conducting research on the commercially important species in the Gulf of Mexico. The uh, proportion of males in the population, the percentage was down around one to two percent. Now we were lucky enough to have a historical set of data. And that was done during the 1970s, before the fishing for gag really started taking off, that showed that the percentage of males in the population was around 20 percent. So it declined dramatically. What had caused this drastic decline? To figure it out, the scientists had to study the gag's reproductive strategy. The females will form what we call pre-spawning aggregations. Basically, they're shallow water areas where they stage up. That happens in December and January. Once the females have fattened up enough and are ready to spawn, they migrate offshore to the shelf edge, where male gag grouper live year-round. It's here that the fish form spawning aggregations during the months of February and March, before the females return to their home sites closer to shore. One of the things about gag is that it appears that sex change is socially controlled. So there is some sort of assessment that goes on at the spawning site, wherever the fish are coming into contact with each other, that the population determines whether the proportion of males is adequate. And so if it's not, that some portion of the population will start changing sex. They'll apparently spawn that year as females, but by the next year, they would be males and join the population as males. So if you think about it, when you're, when you're fishing on a spawning aggregation, 
and sex change is initiated at that time, not only are you catching the existing males, the existing females, but you're catching the presumptive males. So females who've been triggered to change sex, but you're removing them from the population before they have that opportunity. And so it's sort of like a, a ratchet. So the next year there are fewer males and the next year the fewer at, fewer at than that. And it ratchets it down uh, over time. That was about um, you know a 20 or 30 year period. It didn't take long to go from 20% two percent. We don't even know if 20 percent was the norm. It could have been higher than that. The sex ratio wasn't taken into consideration at all in management. Basically, all of management was designed to look at what you caught uh, and from the past project into the future what the population size was going to be like. And that just really doesn't capture it. The biggest concern finding that there was only 2% males in the population was that the fishery wouldn't be sustainable. So we worked with the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council to close off areas. We got 100 square miles in Madison Swanson and 100 square miles in Steamboat Lumps. These closures, which prohibited fishing in the marine reserves, gave the scientists a chance to study if the numbers of males would increase inside the protected areas. What we found in a relatively short period of time uh, was that for GAG, the percentage of males in the population was increasing. This was an encouraging discovery. But to stabilize the fishery, the experts say broader protections are needed. So the ideal management would be to close seasonally the pre-spawning aggregations and completely the spawning aggregations because you want to protect the males. What we'd like to see is a stable fishery that produces a stable economy and that produces happier fishermen. <laughs> there are also protandrous fishes, proto again meaning first and andrus meaning male and those are things like snook and damsel fishes, Nemo. Disney never told us that Nemo changed sex from male to female. Most people are familiar with clownfish, a popular ornamental aquarium fish made famous in the Disney movie Finding Nemo. Clownfish are native to the Indo-Pacific, where they live in anemones. In the wild, you'll see a variety of sizes of clownfish in an anemone. You'll always have one uh, large dominant female, and then you'll have typically a, a slightly smaller male, and then you'll have a bunch of juvenile fish that are still male, because that's how they're all born, and they're kind of waiting their turn for that female to be eaten by another fish, so that then the next largest male will become the female, and the next most dominant little juvenile fish will step up and take his place. But I ask if we can take those out, like, entirely. Dustin Dorton is the president of ORA, a marine ornamental fish farm based in Fort Pierce, Florida, which raises a variety of different clownfish species. A new pair of gold flake clowns. To our knowledge, we're the largest marine ornamental hatchery in the U.S., likely the world. We produce hundreds of thousands of fish a year. Clownfish are the fish that we produce the most of. We set them up as pairs for our purposes here at the hatchery, and that seems to work best for getting the biggest production on them. Unlike other reef fish, which broadcast spawn their eggs and sperm into the water column, clownfish lay their eggs on a smooth surface close to home. At the hatchery, Pairs are provided with a clean tile inside their tank. The larger female will lay her eggs in a circle, with the male moving over the eggs to fertilize them. This process can take several hours. And once the eggs are laid, 
the, the, uh, both parents will tend the nest. They'll um, kind of blow water or breathe on it or they'll fan it with their tail. And they'll also individually pick out unfertilized or otherwise compromised eggs out of the batch. Clownfish are very protective of their eggs, some more so than others. We leave the eggs with the parents usually for about a week. We typically try to transfer the eggs from our broodstock tank to the larval tanks, usually the day that we expect them to hatch or at the earliest the day before. Once the larvae hatch, it takes five to eight months before the fish are of a large enough size to be sold and shipped to a buyer. On a coral reef, many species of fish get frisky around dusk. The best peep show on the reef is hamlets, and these are little, all three to four inch uh, sea basses, and they predictably spawn at the same time in the same location each evening throughout the year. Ned DeLoach is the co-author of several reef fish identification books, as well as a book on reef fish behavior. Together with his wife, Anna, he spent countless hours underwater photographing and observing fish such as the hamlets, which occur in the tropical Atlantic and Caribbean. Well, they have their independent territories, and as it starts to get dark, they leave each evening to a traditional site where they meet up with a rather fateful partner and then they will start courting each other. So they come together and they start acting frisky. Just think of uh, about uh, 11.30, 12.30 to singles bar Friday night at the beach, you know. People start acting stupid, well fish start acting stupid. They all come together and nose up and flare their fins and start twitching back and forth. One of them will change colors and be the aggressor and the other will just act nonchalant and coy. And if you start watching this, you'll think it's never going to happen. Uh, but what they're doing is they're hydrating the female's eggs. So when they are released, they'll be buoyant with the fresh water from her tissue and rise to the surface away from all the hungry mouths on the reef. Then they will all of a sudden come together and they will wrap their bodies around each other and it looks like pure bliss. And in 1001, 1002, 1003, and they pop apart and a little cloud of gametes coming out, the milk from the male and the eggs from the female. Now, here is the genius of the hamlets. They're simultaneous hermaphrodites. They have the reproductive organs of the female and the male at the same time. So the one that acted as the aggressor, in this case, the female, will now be the male and the other will be the female. This process is known as egg trading. It takes a lot of energy to make eggs, which is why hamlets don't release all of them at once. They're parceling out their eggs. They only put out a few at a time to be sure they'll get reciprocated uh, for giving out their eggs. And now you start watching them again, they'll start courting again, but this time it's a little faster. Maybe a minute, maybe three minutes, they'll come together for a second spawn. Then they'll trade behaviors again and they'll do it again. They spawn anywhere from uh, two times to uh, one brawny pair. We saw spawn 20 times one evening. And just when you thought it couldn't get any weirder, meet the deep sea anglerfish. The female, known for her lure-like appendage that she uses to catch her prey, lives in the lonely and lightless depths of the deep sea. It's difficult to find mates in this vast abyss. So when a much smaller, free-swimming male encounters a female, he latches on with his sharp teeth. Over time, he physically fuses with the female and their circulatory systems merge. For the rest of their lives, she'll provide him with sustenance while he provides her with sperm. 
A female can carry multiple males on her body. They live in a very deep, high pressure, dark environment with very little food. So why not have one of them just tag along while the other one is doing all of the searching? It's a strategy for coping in the environment that they live in. In the animal kingdom, truth can be stranger than fiction. Over the course of millennia, nature has adapted a myriad of ways for fish to reproduce, always adjusting to the unique environmental conditions that best suit a species, leaving us to watch, filled with awe and wonder. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct Emotion Club, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventures and scuba diving. And by the Do Unto Others Trust.